Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for dialing in for today's conference. Call will begin in approximately two minutes. Your lines have been placed on listen only until the question and answer portion, at which time you will need to press star one on your touchtone phone. Please ensure that your line is unmuted and record your name and affiliation to be introduced to ask your question. And the conference is being recorded. So if you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Please continue to stand by. Good evening from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Stephanie Pusinski from the Office of Communications. Thank you for joining us for today's pre-launch news teleconference for NASA's Northrop Grumman 20th Commercial Resupply Services Mission to the International Space Station. Liftoff of Northrop Grumman Cygnus cargo spacecraft atop SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket carrying supplies, hardware, and science investigations is now targeted for no earlier than Tuesday, January 30th at 12.07 p.m. Eastern Time to accommodate launch pad readiness. Teams from NASA, Northrop Grumman, and SpaceX just completed the launch readiness review, and senior representatives are here to talk with us more about this important milestone. With us today are Dina Contella, Operations Integration Manager with NASA's International Space Station Program, Megan Everett, Deputy Chief Scientist with the International Space Station Program Research Office, William Gerstenmeier, Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability with SpaceX, Cyrus Dalla, Vice President and General Manager of Tactical Space Systems with Northrop Grumman, and Arlena Moses, Launch Weather Officer for Cape Canaveral Space Force Station's 45th Weather Squadron. Our speakers will each provide opening remarks, then we'll move to questions from reporters on the phone. To enter the question queue, please use star one. To start, we'll hear from Dina Contella, Operations Integration Manager with NASA's International Space Station Program. All right, thank you, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. We're here today to discuss the next cargo flight to the International Space Station, Northrop Grumman's flight NG-20, uh, which is slated to deliver more than 8,200 pounds of cargo, research, and supplies to ISS. Uh, and this will be the first time that Cygnus launches aboard a Falcon 9. Um, as was mentioned, we just finished up our launch readiness review, um, and yesterday ISS held uh, our review of uh, readiness to receive uh, NG-20, uh, the rendezvous, uh, the capture, and the berthing, and that if uh, we lift off on the 30th, then that capture is expected around 3.20 a.m. Houston time, which is 4.20 a.m. Eastern, uh, on the 1st of February. So for that capture, uh, on board, J Jasmine McBelly will be our prime uh, arm operator for operating the Canada Arm 2 for that capture. And Laurel O'Hara will work with her to capture um, to capture Cygnus. Uh, after capture, then we will have the Canada Arm uh, install uh, the, the Cygnus vehicle onto the Earth-facing port of Unity, that's a, a Node 1 Nader port. 
and it will spend about 100 days on board and will depart in July. We're excited about some of the food that we're bringing on board for the crew. Uh, we we'll have a fresh food kit, things like apples and citrus, um, and as well as a bunch of cheese. Um, we've got hazelnut spread, coffee, hummus, uh, and then lots of ice cream. Uh, don't tell the crew some of that's a surprise, but uh, we have um, things like chocolate ice cream, of course, but even some fancier like chocolate brownie and some other um, mint chip and other things as requested by them. So, of course, we're launching scientific uh, investigations. We have a lot, a lot of science happening immediately following the, the actual birthing. Um, and some of those uh, experiments include a 3D metal printer. We have a semiconductor manufacturing experiment uh, and some thermal protection systems for reentry. And Meg Everett, our deputy program scientist, is going to discuss some of, some of those items uh, just after me. So additionally, Cygnus is bringing a lot of critical hardware for us. Uh, we have got some spares coming up associated with our urine processor as well as our oxygen oxygen generator. And we also have a kit coming up for our rollout solar arrays uh, to be installed on uh, in the future. And so this is the third in a series of four sets of arrays. Uh, and so uh, we will perform a spacewalk to install that uh, later this year. Uh, additionally, we also have spare parts for our resistive exercise device for uh, our crew on board. Nothing is, uh, not, all these spares are essentially spare parts for future uh, repairs and or as uh, things go out of life, um, nothing that's um, of extreme criticality. And so on board station, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have a full house of 11 people on board. We've got the Axiom crew. It's our private astronaut mission crew. Um, PAM-3 is what we call it, uh, and they're on board as, along with the Expedition 70 crew. And everything is going extremely well with that, uh, with that private astronaut mission, and they're re they are scheduled to return back home with UNDOC from ISS on, the, on February 3rd. So in terms of upcoming activities, we have got a progress exchange. So those are our Russian cargo vehicles. Progress 87 is scheduled to launch on the 14th. Um, which is the 15th, actually, Baikonur time, uh, on, on Valentine's Day on the 14th. Um, and so the day prior to that, on the 13th, we'll undock the, the uh, progress that's currently there, 86P. Um, and then we have Crew 8 launch just around the corner, so that's targeted for mid-February, and we had a briefing today, in fact, to talk about that um, and our readiness to support, and things are looking really good for that mission. And then we also have a Soyuz rotation coming up on the on, uh, well, before that, we'll, we'll undock our Crew 7 team, which is on board, uh, who are on board right now, and we'll do that um, after about five full docked days of handover between the Crew 8 and the Crew 7 guys. And then um, jumping over to Soyuz, uh, the Soyuz rotation starts on the 21st. Uh, we have a launch um, with uh, a, um, uh, American Tracy Cola Dyson is on board, and that will launch from Bike Baikonur. Um, again, with, and it's a two-orbit rendezvous. Um, and additionally, we'll have soon thereafter uh, on its heels, we'll have a SpaceX Cargo Dragon. We'll have the return um, of the previous Soyuz. Uh, and then, again, on, I know that you've heard all this from Joel from the previous press conference, but um, it, we have the first crewed Boeing test flight to the International Space Station as well. So we have a lot coming up. We are not slowing down, uh, and I really um, would like to thank all of the International Space Station team for putting all this together uh, and getting all of our missions safely accomplished. Relative to NG20, um, I, you know, it really takes a lot of hard work and coordination to get all the science packed on board, get all of the um, partners to provide uh, what they're providing as well. I would really like to thank them. I'd like to thank the Northrop Grumman team and the SpaceX team uh, for getting us prepared for this NG20 mission. It's really critical for ISS, uh, and thanks to everyone's hard work. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Meg to talk science. All right. Thank you, Dina. Can you all hear me okay? Sure can. Okay, great. Well, first off, I'm really excited to get to talk about the science that we're flying up on NG20. And as Dina said, we have a full flight of very exciting investigations. In fact, we have 1,300 kilograms of up mass supporting 46 investigations and facilities. 
And these are from researchers all over the world conducting innovative, world-class, groundbreaking research on the ISS. So we are really excited to see the results of this research. And all of this research is going towards NASA achieving its goals of improving benefits to humans here on Earth as well as extending human presence for longer durations in low Earth orbit, as well as human presence beyond low Earth orbit to the moon and other exploration missions. The different types of science that we're supporting here include areas of human research, technology demonstrations, fundamental science, and Earth-based observations from a lot of our external hardware. And on this flight, we have investigators from our NASA program. We've got our international partners representation from the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency, and a lot of great science coming from our ISS national labs. As Dina mentioned today, I'm just gonna talk about a few of these investigations that are highlighted in our research. And the first one is a metal 3D printer brought to us by the European Space Agency. And here we'll be 3D printing metal products from steel and then returning them to the earth in order to evaluate differences in the product properties between things printed on earth and printed in space. And this could be tremendously valuable as we want to reduce some of our up and down mass uh, as we go towards these exploration missions. So if we can print small parts in space, that'll be tremendously helpful for that situation. The next one is a robotic surgery tech demo, and this is from our, some of our NASA sponsors. And here we'll fly a small robot that will be used to evaluate how well we can do surgeries in space. So we'll not be doing surgeries, small surgeries on astronauts at all. We're using rubber bands uh, as an example of human tissue. And we'll be looking at things like delays in calm and how that affects the ability to do these types of surgeries. So this is very innovative research that not only will it help us extend human presence in space, but it's also extremely valuable for enabling medical capabilities in hard to reach areas here on Earth. So hopefully we'll have great results coming out of that um, that'll really, really help Earth-based benefits and space-based benefits. And then we also have a study brought by our national labs partners, and this is called MISTIC. It's manufacturing of semiconductors and thin filament integrated coatings um, in space. And so here we'll be 3D printing uh, different semiconductors and crystal structures, and we'll be looking at the quality of these printed in space versus what we can print on the ground. And so there is some some research to suggest that we could print higher quality uh, products in space compared to what we do on the ground, which directly translates to better electronics and improved energy production uh, if we can start developing these types of things in space. So this is very innovative, groundbreaking research and excited to see how these turn out in our era of results here. And then lastly, we'll be flying products that will help promote and continue a lot of the human research that we're already doing on the crew members in space. So um, we're really excited to continue that and very thankful for our astronauts for participating in this great research. So with that, I am going to hand it off to William. Thank you. Thank you. SpaceX is honored to launch Northrop Grumman's 20th cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. I think the science that you heard earlier is pretty impressive and pretty exciting, and we're glad to be part of the team that can help deliver Cygnus and the science to the space station. Uh, we just, uh, this week, we get, uh, encapsulated the Cygnus spacecraft uh, in the payload fairing, and it arrived at Launch Complex 40 last night for integration into the Falcon 9 vehicle. That work's going pretty well. We're completing some modifications to the launch pad to, to get it ready to, to go fly. We still have quite a bit of work in front of us. We're going to do a late load activity into the Cygnus vehicle. We modified the fairing, that's the covering that goes on the outside of the, the uh, Falcon rocket, to include a five foot by four foot wide door. It essentially allows us to enter into the fairing area and put late load cargo in. So some of those surprises that was mentioned uh, up front by Dina are going to be delivered in this late load cargo that goes through this new hatch we put in place. And it's it's more than just a hatch. It's 
Actually, we have an environmentally controlled area, so we don't bring any kind of debris or contamination in. The front part of Cygnus is very sensitive. As it bursts the station, there are some rings that seal it to space station. We cannot contaminate those rings. We have to make sure that the cargo is delivered safely through this door into the fairing and then carefully placed inside Cygnus for launch. So that's a pretty intense activity. This will be the first time we've done that. It's taken a lot of modifications on our part to get this hard hardware ready to go fly. We want to make sure it's right. So we think it's it's good to delay a little bit and make sure that we get all this activity right and we're ready to get this cargo safely uh, inserted into Cygnus and get it ready to fly on Tuesday. So again, it's a tremendous honor to be part of this team. It's a neat effort to see how all the, the space flight participants come together. It's a pleasure to work with Northrop Grumman, work with NASA to support the international partners and to, to make space stations successful. With that, I'll turn it over to Cyrus. Thanks, Bill, appreciate it. Um, let's see, for a decade, we have been a trusted partner for NASA, providing one of the most complicated delivery services and uh, and it's been 10 years since we started that journey. In, on January 9th, 2014, we launched Orb 1, and since then we've had uh, 20, 20 successful missions. To date, we've carried 138,000 pounds of cr critical cargo to the ISS, and thinking about that number, it's really just stunning to think about how much we've taken to the space station. And this launch will add another uh, 8,200 pounds uh, to, that, to that number. So, NG-20, aptly named after our 20th mission. I'm talking a little bit about the flow of the spacecraft itself. We delivered the service module here to Kennedy Space Center in mid-December, and, and it met the cargo module, which had been previously delivered. We started the integration of those two modules, the service module and the cargo module together, and we began our cargo load on January 14th. Um, we've talked a lot about the 24-hour late load, We've talked a lot about the goodies that will be provided uh, through that, um, both, uh, both from a scientific perspective and from a support to the astronauts perspective. And um, this, the, uh, so after we do late load and launch and births to the station, uh, we, we are scheduled to arrive at station um, no earlier than Thursday, early morning hours of Thursday, fe February 1st. At that point, we'll, we'll remain attached to the station for up to six months, depending on NASA's mission needs. And if NASA requests it, we'll perform additional services, such as reboosting the station's orbit to, to counteract the atmospheric drag that it um, experiences. And I'll note that Cygnus is the only U.S. space vehicle that has uh, boosted the orbit of the ISS to date. Um, Cygnus, and then finally to complete the mission, Cygnus will, will haul away any waste when it departs the station, another really important function of, of, uh, of, of, of the, the, the platform. So um, moving on, uh, Northrop Grumman has a tradition to name each Cygnus spacecraft after a significant figure in human spaceflight, and so we're proud to name NG-20 uh, in the honor of Dr. Pat Dr. Patty Robertson. Dr. Robertson was a medical doctor who completed a two-year space medicine fellowship at the, at the University of Texas Medical Branch and NASA Johnson Space Center. She was a multi-engine rated flight instructor and avid aerobatic pilot. She accumulated over 1,500 hours of flight time. Dr. Robertson was selected to become an astronaut in 1998 as part of NASA's Group 17, which was called the Penguins. And Dr. Robertson was scheduled to fly to the International Space Station in 2002, but tragically lost her life in, at 2001 at the age of 38 in a, in a private plane crash. Northrop Grumman is honored to, to name its next Cygnus spacecraft in the celebration of, of her life and legacy of Dr. Patty Robertson. Moving on, um, the last time we launched a Cygnus from uh, Kennedy Space Center was 2016 for our sixth Cygnus mission, and that was and this will be the first time that uh, we launched Cygnus on a Falcon 9 rocket, so really appreciate the partnership with the SpaceX team. Um, we've previously launched on our own Antares launch vehicle out of, out of uh, Wallops Island, Virginia, and uh, ULA Atlas V, um, which shows Cygnus' flexibility to launch on a variety of launch vehicles and demonstrates our ability to deliver our commitments to support the NASA mission. We're looking forward to continuing the partnership 
with Kennedy Space Center and SpaceX, and we also look forward to returning to NASA's Wallace Flight uh, Facility in Virginia for, for future Cygnus missions. Um, as we talk about the future of Cygnus and the capabilities that we've brought online through, through the years for secondary payloads and, and science missions to increasing the, uh, the, the, the cargo volume, we're going to continue increasing the cargo uh, volume and mass capability. Um, it'll, uh, for future Cygnus missions, we'll be increasing it from 3,700 kilograms to uh, 5,000 kilograms, which is a real significant upgrade. Um, and then we're also working with Voyager Space to develop an autonomous docking capability to um, support their commercial space station needs uh, as they roll out their, their uh, Star Lab. Um, Cygnus's design is also uh, uh, to be used for future commercial and deep state space logistics missions. So just to close out, um, and NG is fully committed to NASA's cargo resupply missions and supporting the ISS. Um, it, it's been a great partnership over the years, um, and after a decade, <clears throat> pardon me, of supporting NASA and the ISS, we're, we're extremely privileged to be providing this critical service. So just want to thank NASA for the partnership um, with the ISS team, with Kennedy Space Center, with SpaceX and uh, looking forward to a, to a beautiful launch. With that, I'll hand it to Arlena, who's going to tell us about the weather. Thank you, Cyrus. So weather-wise, uh, we're going to be looking at a pattern change here at the spaceport. We've had a pretty good week of above normal temperatures and kind of showery conditions uh, off and on at times. We're going to be looking at our first uh, cold front in a, in a couple of days here uh, coming through this weekend. And the good news for us with that is as that uh, cold front uh, clears us uh, sometime midday Sunday, right behind it, we're going to have a couple days of good weather conditions uh, here at the spaceport. So uh, right now, we are not tracking really any significant concerns uh, for our current no earlier than uh, launch date. Look, overall, looking at a POV of uh, just a probability of violation of really only 5%, uh, just a few scattered clouds in the vicinity, uh, overall uh, light winds, uh, no really concerns there. Uh, if you have to go a couple days uh, into the future with that, you know, weather uh, will kind of be a watch item, but still uh, midweek, next week, uh, overall weather is good with really only uh, that kind of uh, con small concerns uh, for uh, clouds uh, going forth into the future. And with that, I will pass it back to you, Stephanie. Thanks so much, Arlena. We'll now move into our Q&A. As a reminder, please use star one to enter the question queue on the phone. When called upon, please state to whom you are addressing your question to, and please limit to one question at a time so that we can get through as many people as possible. And our first question is going to go to Jeff Faust with Space News. Uh, good evening. Jeff Faust with Space News. <clears throat> question for uh, Cyrus. I'm curious, what differences are there in the processing flow of this Cygnus uh, versus the previous Cygnus missions you launched on Ontario's? And also, are there any capabilities that launching on Falcon 9 provides that you don't get with Antares, or capabilities you had launching on Antares you don't get with Falcon 9? Thanks. Sure, appreciate the question. Happy, happy to answer it. Um, so, you know, just just going over that a little bit, we didn't really have to make any modifications to the to the Cygnus. Um, I'll say the cargo load procedure changed a bit as we're doing it in a new facility with slightly different uh, equipment, but not real major changes to the flow. Um, we really appreciate uh, how SpaceX has worked with us to accommodate the, the, the flow of cargo and integration, and uh, we've been able to reuse a lot of our, our, our procedures. In terms of capability, I think we're, um, you know, both, both, uh, both launch sites and both launch vehicles are providing a very similar capability, um, and uh, Looking forward to a, to a safe ride up to the station here. Thanks, Sir. thanks, Cyrus, and thanks for the question, Jeff. We'll now move on to Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, quick question for, for Gerst. Can you tell us a little more about the, the, the fairing mod? I'm not picturing uh, how the material gets into the capsule once your guys go inside and you mentioned environmentally controlled. I'm just I'm curious what that means. I mean, uh, how that how that process actually works. Thanks. Yeah, there's a 
essentially, we call it a giga door, but it's essentially a five foot by four foot door we've put in the side of the fairing, sits on the bottom. And then there's effectively a, a truck that kind of backs up with a platform that then attaches to the outside of the fairing and then, then essentially seals that volume of the fairing. And then you can go up through the door into the fairing itself. There's some platforms that get erected inside the fairing. And those platforms go to the front part of Cygnus where you can open the hatch of Cygnus and then insert the cargo in the, in the Cygnus uh, uh, vehicle at that point. So that's the basic way that it works. And that entire volume is all uh, atmospherically controlled, isn't configured, and it's like a clean room. So we maintain the pristine environment that, that will be inside Cygnus. So when it attaches the station, there's no contamination or debris that goes in that region. Thank you so much. Next up, we're going to go to Will Robinson-Smith with Spaceflight Now. Yes, hi, Will Robinson-Smith, Spaceflight Now. Thanks so much for taking the time to answer our questions this evening. Uh, Follow-up question for Bill Gerstmeyer. Um, given that flow that you just described, how close to liftoff are you able to do that late load uh, procedure on Cygnus? Thanks. Again, I think the, the planning will be we'll probably do that the Monday uh, afternoon, evening kind of time frame in preparation for the launch on uh, Tuesday. So it'll be over the, the evening period the night before. Thanks for your question, Will. And we're now going to go to Jim Siegel with nasatech.net for our last question. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for taking my question today. Um, one of you mentioned uh, that there were going to be 46 investigations uh, going up on this particular mission. And I'm curious as to um, who chooses those, those uh, investigations and, uh, and what criteria is used to, uh, to choose them. Thank you. Hi, this is Meg Everett. I can take that one. Uh, can you guys hear me okay on this? I can, yes. Okay, great. Uh, so the 46 investigations are prioritized by our NASA sponsors that are funding the science as well as national labs and our international partners. And then in the research office, we take those investigations as they are ready and we prioritize them into onto the different flights as, the, as they become ready. And uh, we look at the crew time as well as condition stowage that we need to get the science up and down and any facilities that they need uh, to support that science. So uh, we, we put that all together and uh, work to get all the science that's planned for any given increment uh, up and down and done really well and efficiently by the crew members. May I ask one follow-up? Sure. Um, so how many uh, investigations roughly are in the queue that are still waiting they're, they're ready to be uh, launched, but uh, are waiting for a ride up. That is completely dependent on the increment. Um, I don't have an exact number account for you right now, but every increment we ask our sponsors to prioritize their science. And as it gets ready, we put it on the vehicle that's the best fit for that science. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. Thank you both. And I apologize. We do have one more question on the line from Bill Harwood with CBS News. So go ahead, Bill. Hey, thanks. Uh, another launch pad question for Gers, but a uh, different pad. Can you give us any update on uh, how you guys are doing out at 39A to get ready for the uh, Intuitive Machines launch? Thanks. Yeah, we've been we've been pretty busy preparing you know, 39A for the intuitive uh, launch. As you know, we have to put uh, liquid uh, methane and liquid oxygen inside the fairing on that flight for intuitive machines. So we made some modifications to the uh, transporter erector to accommodate that. We did some cold flow testing today. We'll probably try to do some testing over the weekend to make sure we can get the right interfaces to give the right quality of propellant to the intuitive machine payload that's going to fly uh, next week. So I think that work in, our, in a couple of weeks, but that work is pretty much on track as we're going through through the activity. But it's a lot of modifications to us, a lot of uh, uh, interesting integration. But again, I think, as you see, even with this Northrop Grumman 20 mission, we at SpaceX like to do innovative and creative things. So. 
you can give us a challenge and you tell us we need to cut a five foot by four foot hole in the fairing and we figure out a way to go do that. The fairing is still recoverable just as they were before. We're doing the same thing. This will be the first time we've carried a cryogenic payload inside the fairing. So again, SpaceX is continually being challenged to do new things by, our, by the customer needs and we stand up to meet those customer needs and deliver for them. All right, thank you all so much for your questions and thank you once again to our panelists for taking time out of your busy pre-launch schedules to talk to us more about this important mission. As you heard, liftoff is now targeted for Tuesday, or for no earlier than Tuesday, January 30th at 12.07 p.m. Eastern Time. Stay tuned to nasa.gov for launch updates and enjoy the rest of your evening. This does conclude today's conference call. We thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect and have a great rest of your day.